Hello everyone, my name is Alessandro and this is the Temple of Surf, the podcast will give you full access to the best surfers, skaters, shapers, surfboard collectors, shop owners in the world. Discover with me their stories, the greatest successes, amazing behind the scenes and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to the 15th episode of the 5th series of the Temple of Surf, the podcast. I'm so happy because today with us we have Robert Wingnut Weaver, protagonist of amazing surf movies like Endless Summer 2 and of course Great Surfer. Discover with him about surf, surfboards, longboard, Santa Cruz and much more. Hi, Robert. Welcome to the show. Where are you today? Uh, I'm home in Santa Cruz. Uh, looks like we've got a uh, storm front coming in today. So there's south winds already, not much uh, surf opportunity. So it's a good time for the podcast. Yeah, it's a great time for the podcast. I should thank Mother Nature for giving me <laughs> <laughs> to have you at home and to, to dedicate time for us. So today we're going to talk about many, many, many things. Um, but the first question that I ask everybody on the show uh, as a warm-up is, in your opinion, what is the most important thing in surfing? I uh, Just having fun. I mean, people get to take this thing too seriously. You know, we're not out there curing cancer. It's an extremely selfish sport. You get a wave. It doesn't do anyone any <laughs> any good. It's just about you. Yeah. So realize how selfish you're being when you're surfing and uh, relax a little bit more. Exactly, right? Because unfortunately, still a lot of people are really not having fun or they don't really go into, into surfing with a lot of spirit that should be actually much more, uh, you know, like that than, you know, but what to do. We are all different. And so it's, uh, I guess it will not be possible to have a perfect uh, surf environment in the water, anywhere in the world, right? So uh, let's talk about um, you as a, as a surfer and let's go back a little bit with the time. I'm very interested in your first surfboard and the proper one, right? And um, and also to know if you still have that. So the board that I learned on was uh, an early 1960s Dave Sweet. And... I got it from my wrestling coach. Okay. Uh, he, he was a bartender uh, in Newport Beach, and they were redoing the tiki bar theme that they had at their bar, and they were getting rid of the surfboard. So he knew I was just learning how to surf, so he gave it to me. It still had the tiki bar prices, drink prices on it, like my tie, $1.25, you know. <laughs> so I peeled those letters off, waxed it up, and took it down to Newport to Blackie's and was trying to figure out how to surf with it there. Okay. And no, I do not have the board anymore. I ended up trading it a few years later to uh, a surfer artist named Walter Visalai. And uh, Walter ended up taking it down to Mexico and it lives down there somewhere now. Okay. So it's uh, good to know that still that board is uh, uh, you. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> we can say those, so. those early, those early 1960s boards were very durable. Let's say that. Yeah, definitely. Though uh, a lot of them got snaps in the rocks because, you know, like uh, no leash and, uh, you know, like. They, they, didn't, they didn't break in half as much as they just got so many holes in them. They eventually went from being 30 pounds to 60 pounds to 260 pounds. So. Yeah, definitely quite difficult to lift them at a certain point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, so you are from uh, uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, so you live in no. actually, you're living in Santa Cruz, right? I live in Santa Cruz. I was raised down in Newport Beach. Okay. And so how would you define the relationship between you and the waves of Santa Cruz? There's the opportunity to find surf, you know, 300 days out of the year at least is strong. I mean, we get south swells, we get north swells. So we rarely can we not surf. It's usually just because the tide is too high or there's just happens to be too much south wind. Like when the storm front like this comes in, it actually swings in from the south and it's the only wind that Pleasure Point can't handle. So it was a fantastic place to take the beach break surfing that I grew up doing in Newport, bring it up here and get to ride Pleasure Point, you know, 
it really helped refine my surfing. Nicola, that uh, helped me to do the interview today, told me is the most localized uh, place in the planet. <laughs> so <it's really laughs> you know, it's it's not that bad. I mean, I think the locals they got grumpy again. You know, over the last couple of years with the pandemic, just because so many people got in the water that just didn't know the basic rules, and so there there is a louder bark. <laughs> If there's you know. There's no longer really any true violence in the lineup just okay. because people sue each other for saying the, you know, the wrong words, let alone for, for hitting someone. But so it's a pretty vocal group that controls the top of the point, the middle of the point. And if, if your skill set is strong, you just wait your turn and you'll work your way into the rotation of the group. But it's, uh, it's pretty loud when you first paddle out if they don't know you. Yeah, I I, I, and I I kind of like when you were saying like oh, there is no really violence in the in the lineup like if everybody's coming with a knife or something. <laughs> I'm not well, not in California, not in California because of the, the the legal system and people want to sue. I've still seen it in other places in the world. Yeah, you know, like uh, sometimes, like the like the movie Point Break, you know, like they come with the, the knife, <laughs> very local. Uh, yes, true, exist, you know, like uh, I don't want to serve those, those places, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will give those waves away, no problem at all. No want to get in trouble. Um, in your career, you met a lot of uh, surfers. Is, was there a particular meeting with one of them that you consider particularly meaningful for you? I, I think getting to, getting to surf with Phil Edwards was really a, a special moment for me because Phil was kind of my icon hero of, you know, it started from Phil and kind of went down from there. Um, I mean, I still like my boards to have, you know, a picket fence nose like the old Phil Edwards models. And that also came from, you know, Quig and Malibu stuff. But I, i had really wanted to to have phil make me a board and i had approached and this was before endless summer too i had approached him and bill and the hobie family about trying to make hobie surfboards more current and more relevant and this is back in the late 80s early 90s mm -hmm. and phil was interested you know phil just wanted to make surfboards you know he was a craftsman who just loved building boards for guys who wanted to surf. So he said, you know, he liked to, to surf San Onofre really early in the morning. You know, he'd surf for about an hour and try to get out before anybody else really showed up. So I can remember um, driving down to Old Man's and sitting in my van and waiting for him, you know, waiting for him to show up. And there's, you know, it was first light, but there was already two or three people in the water. And I'm watching this one guy. He's going right, but he keeps looking over his left shoulder. Uh -huh. looking over his left shoulder and then finally the turn comes you know and he just swings that board around and that beautiful phil edwards turn and i'm like shit he already got out there before me like i couldn't <laughs> get my suit on fast enough couldn't paddle out fast enough and we got to surf for about i got to surf about 45 minutes with him there and then uh then he took me up to his uh house and uh pulled out some wood to build a board for me so you uh, you still have that board that board i still have and will always have i wanted to have a uh a balsa board made by him. Yeah. And so he built me two boards with four stringers that were kind of set up for what I wanted to do with Hobie and which ended up not working out. But then we went back and he built me the balsa board. It's a true legend. You know, when we talk about long board or style, you know, it's a uh, Phil Edwards. And it's my dream to have him in the show. And I'm just thinking it's 92, whatever. And I'm trying, you know, they told me like, yeah, if you want to contact him, you have to to go through Obi in Dana's Point because he's always <laughs> passing by over there. But I, I guess that will be uh, my dream uh, interview. I don't know if I can ever catch him. I, I don't think you'll get it. He's, he's very reclusive and he doesn't do a lot of interviews. Phil Edwards, of course, great surfer. A great craftsman and amazing surfboard that you have in your collection forever. You know, like I, I think those are like, uh, if we think about uh, Phil Edward, uh, Pat Curran, or at a certain point, Skip Fry, you know, like we are there, right? The, the right. Long cruise ultra of longboard, uh, of longboard shaper, you know, that, uh, that creates like so much for, for, for the people of today, right? 
And so, before the classical question about endless summer, too, <laughs> I would like to ask a question regarding uh, surfboards. Traditional surfboard or progressive? So, uh, longboard. I've I've always been a single fin guy, uh -huh. so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I toyed with, you know, when I was living in Newport back in the early night, uh, late 80s, we had a couple of, you know, tri-fin longboards made. But really for everything that I wanted a surfboard to do, I wanted it, it needed to be a single fin. And for the way that the reason why I started riding longboards and always kept into that school of thought was because of what they rode with single fins. And I think the only way I could really understand the craft and how they served was to ride single fins like they did, which is why I have some older boards because I want to ride a board that was, I want to ride a John Peck Penetrator. I want to ride, you know, a Phil Edwards model. I wanted to ride those boards that they rode to really understand how talented they were to ride them. Because yeah. the boards we make today can have the same shape, but it's going to be 10, 15 pounds lighter than those yeah. boards. We have the advantage of better rocker. We have the advantage of better materials and fins. So really understanding how great of surfers they were is to ride the boards that they rode. Definitely. I, I totally agree with you. And, you know, like facing, you know, like, uh, uh, like comp if my dream is like a competition with all the old sort of long boards, you know, and, and see how, how oh. even the, the champions of today will react, right? Well, and, and th those still happen. Well, you know, we, it's called the log jam here in Santa Cruz now. It used to be the, um, what was it? Can't remember. I have a trophy here somewhere. Um, the log jam is an old board contest and they have old mal contests in Australia all the time. And to me, that's really the, the best of it, right? Seeing the, the, our modern athletes, our modern surfers riding vintage surfboards because yeah. the boards haven't changed at all they're not you know most of them are, are the same weight they're the exact same boards those guys were riding back then and it's funny when i when i come across old older surfboards you know boards made in the 60s some of them are like they've never been ridden and they probably didn't work very well yeah <laughs> but the ones the ones that are dented and dinged and repaired those were good ones that they rode as much as they could. So sometimes the, the real pretty wall hangers are not what you want. You want those beat up riders. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. And, you know, I, I was interviewing Joey Cabell and he told me like, Alessandro, we were like shipping our own surfboard. And most of the time they were crap because <laughs> we didn't know what to do. You know, we were just like, it was try and error basis. You know, it's like we were making them. And the same thing with, um, Gordon and Smith, uh, at the very beginning, they were making boards for themselves. And then uh, they started with the friends and friends and friends. But uh, at the beginning, the beginning uh, Eric Gordon, uh, the son, told me, like, at the beginning, I'm sure, you know, they were not, like, really good one to surf, right? So, <laughs> that you, when you looked at the really early, like, the pre-1964 surfboards, um, they weren't very special. They were, they were pretty round rails there were no rocker in the boards there was a little bit of the template change you know curve in the hips would help them and they just had the big d fins so i mean the boards were very average and the surfers that rode them well were above average yeah. and so then if, if if you were lucky if you were in in the hobie group or the harbor group or the gns group you know you'd have a shaper that was a good surfer and then you'd have a couple of good surfers with them so they could talk about what was working and not working. And it's that shaper-surfer relationship that to this day is still super important in the progression of surfing and surfboards. Of course. And if you talk with uh, uh, those shapers, let's say, that are shaping since a long, long time, you know, like uh, you go from Pat Rosso and Dick Brewer or, you know, like the Skip Fry, but also uh, other, you know, like uh, Stu Gans and whatever. They say, you know, I want their relationship with the surfer. I don't want to shape just for the... The, 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 the stock board to go on the rack, right. I want to. I want that. I want to improve my, my craft, you know, and I'm, I really care about the feedback that I'm given, you know. And not just like, oh, your, your board served good and that's it. You know, it's like much, much more than that. And uh, and I, I guess that was the old school of uh, thinking, you know. And it's still so amazing because today we are still living in an era where all these people are all alive. And they can still 
transmit their uh, craftsmanship that is much more than uh, copy and paste by by computer, right? Even if computer maybe is a, a, with the technology is going to go even more and more and more perfect. Um, talking about shapers, uh, another question uh, inspired by Nick, Nicola, <laughs> Nick, <laughs> is um, about uh, uh, Robert August and your uh, special relationship that you have with uh, uh, with him and his uh, surfboard. I, uh, frankly speaking, I was not so much informed about Robert August, and I get to know him that is in Cal- in uh, Costa Rica right now, right? Correct. I wrote to him as well through a, a surf shop in Costa Rica. <laughs> I said no. Now I want to have him in the shop. <laughs> so tell me about this because. And yeah, Nick was like very adamant in saying, you have to ask this question. Well, you know, Robert was in the original Endless Summer and I got to know him really well just as we started making Endless Summer 2. And, you know, we've been, you know, friends now for, for 35 years. And I was lucky enough to, after we did the movie, to continue to ride his surfboards and to travel around the world with him. We would do promotions about the surfboard company, about the movies. And he just had a had and has a really good outlook on life. You know, he always likes to see the best in people, which was always great. And just sharing like, so, so for me, the original surf guys are accidental legends. They didn't, you know, become a surf legend. That was their plan. They're a legend because they're still alive. Because, they, you know, they were a really good surfer at that time and they accomplished, you know, what they could. There was no money in it back then. You know, very rarely, like Corky Carroll made good money on a signature model. There were a few guys that did, but they did it because they really loved doing it. And they wanted to do something other than get a real job. <laughs> so they, if they were lucky enough to make a life and career out of whether they were a surfboard shaper or worked with one of the companies, that, that was great. And so Robert's attitude has always been so giving and so fun. I mean, you just want to go to the beach and hang out with Robert. You want to listen to his stories. You want to, you know, rock trade waves with him. I mean, he was always like when you'd surf with him, the most patient in the lineup. I mean, it comes with being older. But, you know, I mean, at the time, you know, I was 30 years old and he was 50. And now I'm 56 years old. Right. So I'm older than he was. And just his patience in the lineup of, and always getting the best wave when they would come in. You know, he had those 20 extra years of looking out to sea, spotting the best set, figuring out where the best wave was and making it look effortless. You know, and that's what I've tried to take steel from his knowledge and, you know, and, and use is that that experience and that patience in the lineup. And it's so amazing. I mean, uh, the people I contacted uh, to have an interview with him, they told me that he's in Costa Rica and he's still shipping. Um, he's shaping surfboards. He does two, two or three a week. He's working out of the Witches Rock Surf Camp. In yeah, exactly. people like right. Like, yeah. yeah, so he he's in there. He shapes two or three boards a week. Uh, still loves making surfboards for people. You know, and it's it's like where do you, and, and just the basic questions like where do you surf? What kind of wave is it? Yeah. You know, you know, are 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 you have a lot of wind? Do you have a beach break? You know, he wants to know. He wants to make that board for you. You know, it's re- it's really fun to to watch him go through the process with people. Amazing, and you know, when you were talking, uh, it made me think. You know, like two years ago, I was very very lucky. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, speak with Greg Knoll, and uh, I don't know if you want to hear the episode. is uh, uh, It's quite interesting, and we were talking about legend, right? And he told me, like, uh, uh, you know, I asked him, "Do you consider yourself a legend?" And he told me, like. If you say so, <laughs> we, were, we were a bunch of guys on the beach having a lot of fun and paddling out and catching waves. And I don't know if that makes me a, a legend, you know. And of course, I mean, he, he is a legend. You know, what, what Greg Knoll was, he was able to build from shaping, surfboards, longboard, uh, waymare, uh, whatever, you know, icon, right? Uh, but again, is what you just said, you know, the accidental, accidental. Yeah, they, they, they were just good, great guys on the beach. And, you know, <laughs> you know, that time amazing to live, you know, like when you have, uh, I don't know, Joy Cabell, Fred Emmings, uh, Duke uh, <laughs> going around, uh, 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 going around uh, the 
California, you know, just like to promote the sport. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're true pioneers, right? They, they, they created a path that the rest of us could follow. Exactly. You know, they weren't intentionally trying to do it. They were just trying to avoid, I think, the traditional careers that were available at the time. You know, once they discovered surfing and their passion for it, they're like, I don't want to get a real job that's going to take me away from doing this that that gives me so much pleasure. So they created their own. So they pioneered a lifestyle and, and an industry like the surf industry just so they could, you know, <laughs> avoid getting a real job. <laughs> and, and, and trust me, they work hard. If, you know, you've seen surfboards being built, shapers and factories. I mean, it's a, it, it, it's physical labor. It's artistic craftsmanship, but it, it's better than having a real job. Uh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, this is the fifth series. And in the fifth series, there will be, of course, you, but the, the one other person that I interview is David Noiva. And uh, he told me, like, Alessandro, you know uh, how amazing it was, like, to get all these uh, great cars and surf and go around with my longboard and meet uh, the Duke on a Rolls Royce because he was there promoting surfing and, you know, the life that they did, you know, like, wow, you know, it's just something, something that will never happen again. Those early days. Are... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was, for me, I've always looked at that mid 1960s period into the 70s as where everything was kind of okay in the world you know even though it was a complete counterculture lifestyle it it wasn't you know intentionally trying it wasn't trying to do a harm to anyone else they would just leave us alone so we could surf as much as possible and everything that they were doing although some of it's against the law now it wasn't then <laughs> you know and they weren't harming anyone else they were just trying to have as much fun in their own lives as they could and their opportunities to travel and, yes. and, and see parts of the world were pretty amazing. Exactly. Expectations were less, and I guess everything that came uh, was a uh, plus and, uh, and a good thing, right? Well, today I think the expectations are very high, even in pro surfers. And so yeah. uh, if you don't achieve, then you're not good enough, you know? And at that time, I don't think, I, 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 I mean, I was not there, but as, as they say, I don't think there was competition, right? But at the end, it was friends, you know, the among. Oh, yeah, and and you know, there was less. I mean, you you definitely wanted to win the contest. You and it wasn't that there was that much money in winning the contest, but like the the status. Of, you know, it's like your friends who wants to be the best surfer each day, right? I want to get the best wave out there, you know. And so it was it was that as much as anything else. And then slowly, as the mid '60s got going, and the signature models like. Corky Carroll versus Gary Proper versus the David Nueva model. I mean, it was it was important. There was actually money being made, you know. And David, David and Corky were like a, one of the few guys that made that transition from longboard to the shortboard era, and you know, surfed exceptionally well. Had their boards go through and made money as as surfers, like really the first pro surfers going into the modern era of making money before there was sponsorship. Yeah. And Corky Carroll, Corky told me, uh, Alessandro, you know, like I asked him among your all success and uh, titles uh, and wins, what was the most important one? And he told me, you know, when he's been voted the best surfer in the world by his colleagues and that he told me, I consider that the best achievement of my career because I care about what the, my peers. Thought exactly. Of. For sure. That makes all the sense in the world. And he says quite a lot about the personality too, right? He could have said, I've been here and there, I won here, <laughs> I won quite a lot. But nevertheless, it's still uh, uh, is relevant to what other people, uh, the appreciation of his friends at a certain, at a certain point. So uh, let's go back to, uh, I, actually, I will ask you the endless summer too as a last question, because I really like <laughs> the way it goes. Um, so uh, let's talk about um, surfing in China, right? So you went one of the first to go in, uh, in China and surfing over there. What is so special of, uh, of China? Apart that, I guess, the empty, empty waves and empty beach and empty crazy. Well, you, you're, you're getting right to the point right there. You know, it's one of the last places where the water is tropical. You know, the, the beaches are beautiful, uncrowded. I mean, that's all we want, really. 
And it's, you know, thanks to Nick, there's, it's still where you can explore and discover new search spots. Yeah. You know, and that's, that hasn't been around since the seventies, you know, when most of the surf exploration was done, you know, that to actually find brand new, you know, beaches and parts of coastline, you, know, you can't do that. So when I was fortunate enough to go there, you know, 10 or 11 years ago and, you know, go exploring up and down the coast of Hainan, you know, with Nick and some of the guys over there, that was amazing. I didn't think I'd ever get to, you know, explore an Island and find waves you know, at least warm tropical ones. You know, I went to Iceland, did that. That was cold. <laughs> I guess so. I'd, ra- I'd rather drive around Hainan some more and look for waves. So yeah. it was just, it, you know, and it was, it, it, it really showed me that, you know, I, politics are a different subject. Never want to get into that. But when you meet the people in a country, you realize the people are great. Like we're, we're in Riyuan Bay, where mama had a restaurant and in other small little coastal places in China, the people were so friendly. It's just like Mexico and Costa Rica. You know, people have a little, a little shack restaurant on the beach. They'll watch your stuff. They'll enjoy watching you surf. They think you're crazy for going out there and they come and feed you and they'll take, you know, a few pennies out of your hand. I mean, they're the nicest people in the world and it renews your faith in the global culture (laughs) that people are good Governments might argue, but just leave us alone so we can go surfing. Exactly, exactly, and it's important. Nevertheless, you know, Nick is very territorial in uh, <laughs> Ireland, and you know, I even asked him what is his favorite surf spot. He said, "Like I will not tell you." Like, okay, he's yeah. very afraid that you know. At a certain point, he's saying like he's doing so much for promoting like surf in China, but then when you ask, uh, "Ah, which one is your favorite surf spot?" I will not tell you. Even <laughs> I don't know if uh, yeah. It's, it's funny because because he's going to take me to his favorite spots, but he won't tell me. You know, we'll just make up a name for it because I'm not going to be able to pronounce the Chinese name anyway. You know, so whether we call it the Jetty, the Point, you know, yeah, you know, we make up funny names anyway, and it's like it's too hard to find a place there without Nick taking you. So he can tell you the name of it, and it wouldn't matter. Yeah, yeah, no matter, right? But, you know, let's look at the pipeline uh, in, in Hawaii, you know, it's, the name was given because there was a pipeline next to it. So, so Exactly. I think <laughs> you can be very creative uh, with the name. Well, we, we, we called a spot testicles because there were two <laughs> floating buoys right next to each other and like that. Let's go surf testicles. Exactly. You know, that's actually a good <laughs> point because you can create names that down the road, maybe 50 years from now, say like, let's surf testicles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. And um, let's uh, talk about Endless Summer 2 uh, before my last question for you. Obviously, this movie changed your life, right? And I think the relationship with uh, um, Bruce Brown and Dana, that actually, uh, an amazing guy. I met, I interviewed Dana for the show. Is like, uh, they, they now, sorry, they, they now, they're not, they're not Dana, Dana is another. And is um, amazing. Uh, I, I guess like working with them uh, has been something like uh, an, a great experience for you. So, how did everything change and how was really the experience to work with a legend like Bruce Brown? You know, it, Bruce, you know, Bruce really became, you know, a mentor, a friend, you know, a father figure and, and Dana, Wade and Nancy, you know, the kids, you know, they, they like allowed me into the family. Like I was, I was almost becoming like the fourth kid, you know, where I was, I'd, I'd stop and see mom and dad all the time, Dana. I mean, Bruce and his wife, Pat, cause they're in just North of Santa Barbara. So they're halfway between where I am in Santa Barbara cruise and where my family is in Newport Beach. So I would always stop when I was going north or south. And just getting to spend time with Bruce as you know, just as, as as a human, you know, as a dad, as a business guy, as a surfer, you know, I could talk to him about anything. And so really the best thing that happened out of Endless Summer 2, I mean, it gave me career opportunities, sponsorship opportunities, but like having Bruce in my life really became the best thing about it. And I've spent more hours on the couch talking with him, making dinner with him and just learning about life from him was great. And the fact that, you know, 
I, I probably have never laughed as hard as I've laughed when I'm with Dana Brown is individually the, the funniest human being I've ever spent time with. And just telling stories with him and creating stories. I mean, you could spend all day with Dana Brown, you're with him. And then he would tell you the stories about what you did with him. And they were funnier coming from Dana than they were when you actually lived them. So it was like that, those were that relationship with that family is the best thing that came out of endless summer too. Amazing. And you know, I, I have seen uh, like uh, last year has been released last year, uh, a life of endless summer. The, the the story of Bruce Brown. Yes. I don't know if you have seen the, the movie. I did. And he's just like such an amazing human being, uh, Bruce Brown, and uh, as well fun. Yeah, I, I see, you know, like he was like amazing. And, the, and to see him traveling and see his own uh, friends at that time was still Obi, right? When he was... Uh, Obi was still alive and going and seeing Grubby Clark and yeah, going over all trip and uh, I mean, he was. I never met him. I met him through the the words of uh, Dana, and uh, uh, that was, I guess, was a great, great, great guy. And so I, I, I see what you're saying, and I, I think it's over the last over the last thirty years, you know, especially early when we were still making the movie, and and the first five, ten years after. So many, you know, Bruce was living in this remote canyon north of Santa Barbara. So he was kind of a hermit, but he was a hermit by geography, not by personality. Yeah, exactly. He loved when his friends would come and visit. So I would be driving through and I'd stop and you'd have some of the motorcycle guys there or some of the old surf guys were there. And I would just sit there and be a fly on the wall and listen to stories. Yeah. And it was the best you yeah. can imagine. You know, because they lived through the most interesting times, you know, from post-World War II to now. So it was just sitting there and listening and enjoying all that was fantastic. Amazing. So tell me a, a little bit about your future projects. Are you working on something particular, like <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, something I, that I, hide in the drawer that the project <laughs> do? Well, the only thing I'm hiding in the drawer is trying to get back to go surfing with Nick and Hainan. You know, I, I, I still think that there's parts of that island I'd love to go surf and get to do it before it gets overrun with crowds. Yeah. You know, it's like the lat for me, as far as I can, you know, look at the map and see, it's the last chance to go somewhere that I think is still, you have the benefit of, of an incredible culture and civilization and the food and everything about China I love and still uh, a coastline that's open to be explored. Yeah. And so we maybe have five years left of that. So that's my my goal over the next five years is to try to get back there and surf a bunch. You know, I my bad. I don't need to go to Indonesia and the Mentawais or any of that. Just let me get back to Hainan and go surfing. Okay, okay, surfing testicles again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we're gonna finish our interview with a short Q and A session. So please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind. Okay, the best surfboard that you ever ridden. Uh, a Mike Marshall surfboard, nine foot, the red striper. Your favorite shaper? Mike Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> it called one on the other, it calls the exactly <laughs> each other. Uh, personal question, your favorite song? Huh. Forget it. Don't have one. <laughs> General <laughs> music. I don't know. Right. You know, I really I really don't listen to a lot of music, so at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chinese music, Ch Chinese traditional music. No, that I know for sure. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, your favorite surf spot outside China? <laughs> uh, that'll be Pleasure Point. Okay, definitely right. And uh, your favorite longboard surfer of all time? Joel Tudor. Yeah, it was amazing to see him win now huh? in Malibu. Oh, so so happy for that! Wow. You know, that puts like a stand to I loved him schooling all the kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, you know. Uh, well, it, it shows you that, you know, the longevity in, in, in riding longer boards, you can still, it's all technique more than it is. I mean, obviously, Joel's in amazing shape, but it, it's technique and skill, and age can really help with that. Yeah. Age and experience. 
Yeah, definitely. And you know, I was talking uh, two days ago with Badzi Carbox, you know, and uh-huh. he told me that uh, that they had like a competition who was able to stay on the nose for that long. Him and he said like I was like maybe uh, 15, 20 seconds. I was very good, and in the same competition, Joel was like forty six seconds on the nose. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, class, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So the last question is a bit unusual. I told you already before, so you had all the time to think. Uh, what is your best relationship advice? Pick a woman who's smarter than you. Oh, yes. Definitely. <laughs> I agree with you, right? <laughs> so she can guide you through. Well, just so that she's got your back. I mean, you talk about, you know, your, your wife as being a partner. And if you truly have somebody that is as smart or smarter than you, then you, you know that she's got your back and you can trust her with those decisions that are, that are important in your life. And I've been lucky. We just had our 30th anniversary. So amazing. Congrats. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Cool. Thank you so much, Robert, for being on the show with me today. And I look forward to talk to you very soon. All right. Great. That was enjoyable. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo. Mahalo.